<laughs> Welcome to the Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. And with us today, once again, is a philosophy professor and objectivist and the author of numerous articles, books, and booklets, including this one. Uh, I can't get it. Uh, I can't get it right. But let's I'll see, tell see, you. Let's, there how's, you how's, go. There you that? go. Can everybody perfect. see that? It's perfect. So he's here to talk about, and I got to tell you, uh, this is one hell of a provocative title, American Racism, Its Decline, Its Baleful Resurgence, and Our Looming Race War. So I guess the first thing is, what's the book about and what made you write it? Well, uh, it's been scary. I've been, to me, the uh, after years of making progress on the issue of racism, you know, I... Uh, and over the last 10, maybe even 20 years, I've seen the, the resurgence of it. And it's it's very scary. Uh, for, you know, for one thing, I mean, I have real antipathy towards the left. I mean, I just loathe them. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm not crazy about the religious conservatives either. I don't just think they're not quite as bad. But the, the, the left has just been... Sp- Viewing anti-white racism for years now, and it's uh, and it's terrifying. Well, at the same time, their policies kill Black Americans by the thousands every every year, uh, and so I see, you know. And then there's the the so-called alt right, Richard Spencer and those guys were basically neo Nazis. Unfortunately, they're not very popular yet. But with the left spewing out all its, the Marxist left spewing out all this anti-white racism, I can see white people gradually starting to gravitate towards the so-called all right uh, as a means to protect them from the anti-white racism of the left. So, uh, yeah, I think racism is ominously on the rise. This was, you know, I was working on this even before this explosion of Jew hatred in the last, in the last couple of, last couple of months. But that's always been around. There's just been there's, they've been they've been hiding, mostly on the left, but also amongst the the uh, white supremacists, you know, alt right types. Uh, so I see the I see the resurgence of racism everywhere in the culture. I think the culture is more racist today than when I was a kid in the 1960s. You know, and there was a lot of anti black racism amongst white Americans still back then. And we made a lot of progress on it since, but I think I, I think the country is more racist today than at any time in my lifetime. It scares the hell out of it. You know, it's interesting to me because I don't know if that's true, and I'll tell you why. I certainly think that judging by social media, the the nightly news, the newspapers, that you're you're right. But I also know, like my experience on social media, is so different than my experience when I leave the house. So I wonder how common this type of stuff is in amongst regular folks as compared to what it appears in, in the media. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's a, that's a good point, Michael. Uh, see, I'm in the universities. And so I have a different, you know, different everyday experience than, than you do. And I have, Students, I you know, just I won't mention any names, but just this this past mess, I had some some good kids, uh, you know, some really you know, they said good kids, good students, smart kids. I really like them as a person at a personal level, um, but they just regarded uh, they as self evident that white people have done all these horrible things in history, and I, I've known other people in the in the past students, um, you know, I dated a. A woman who who went who who she was from India, you know, but but she gone through this the school system here, and she oh, there was these white Europeans they've done all these horrible things, um, and it's uh, in the universities the school system in the universities is prevalent. It's uh, it's 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 Marxist postmodernist propaganda, and it take an encyclopedia to refute them. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Excuse me. Um, I think you know, the, woke, I, the wokesters might be poisoning you. They don't like me. <laughs> they want, but, want you to know, shut you up. But I told them, I, I, the students, I, I said, look, here's the short version. 
the white Europeans have done, you know, a lot of bad things. There's no question about it. Conquering, you know, they're stealing people's land. That's what the students say. You know, you know, and including the Israelis, they, they, they bring bring that up up to date. It's self evident to them that the land belongs to the Palestinians, and the Israelis stole it. Um, but uh, so there's a lot of bad things. I say, you know, that's most of that leftist propaganda on this issue is true, although some of it's false. But it's a gigantic example, the half truth fallacy, the less than half truth, you know, of a partial truth fallacy. Because what will all the rest of the people around the world do? Their own Boy Scouts will be victimized by the evil white man. It's like, you know, give them the history lesson about the Mongols and the, you know, and the Middle East, you know, the Arabian Arabs and all, and all the slave trade that was, you know, all up what was going on in North America continent among the American Indian tribes before the arrival of the Europeans. It was endless conquest, bloodshed, you know, and, and so on and so forth, showing that other people around, around the world were at least as bad. And then two, the tremendous achievements of Western civilization uh, that you know have been so life-giving all over the world, the advances in agricultural science, medicine, every field you want to mention, that people are alive all over the world today, not just white people, because of advances that were made in, in the West, largely by white people, which means nothing to me, but I have to, you know, have to answer the racist. <laughs> you know, it's prevalent in the universities, Michael. I think you're right about the man on the street, but it's prevalent in the school system and universities. I thought you did a really good job of explaining uh, postmodernism in this book. <clears throat> and it's it, postmodernism, obviously, is a very uh, broad concept. But you did a good job of explaining its sort of manifestation in the modern left and the, the woke mentality. Give us a quick, and I know it's tough to give a quick rundown, but that's what I want you to do because we do have a lot, a lot to cover. Yeah, the postmodernists, uh, the leading, you know, the generally French philosophers, Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, some some Americans like Richard Rorty. But uh, they're, I think, Michael, you know, jocularly as as Marxists on steroids, you know, <laughs> because, you know, Marx, of course, saw the world, the social world, not in terms of human individuals, but in terms of, of groups, specifically economic class groups, and argued the whole essence of Marxism is uh, the class struggle, you know, that the, the owning class victimizes and exploits the, the working class. Well, the postmodernists have gone... Way beyond that, <laughs> yeah, I'm getting over a cold. That's why. So, excuse me. Um, to them, they agree with Marx that society is divided up, not or made up, not in terms of individuals, but in terms of classes and and warring classes at that. But it's not just the rich exploiting the poor. Now, you know, it's the whites exploiting the non-whites, the the uh, males exploiting the females, the straights exploiting the gays, and so on. And it's paramount, a uh, paramount moral importance for us to side with the oppressed, in the in the eternal struggle against the oppressor. And this is where, as postmodernism became dominant in the teachers' colleges, in the school system, in the humanities classes of our universities, you know, let's call it nineties, uh, two thousand. This is where you see the the rise of so called woke culture. The essence of which is one. America is systemically racist, you know, even today. And two, white people are inherently, inveterately racist. It's hardwired into our character. But the key, and we discussed this on the in the philosophy sessions we did, right? The, the essence of the postmodernist is it's a Kantian Hegelian phenomenon, namely, you know, the human mind creates its own world, its, its subjective world, and different societies or nations or groups within nations you know, like the owning class or the working class created differently. And so <laughs> males have their, their truth, females have their truth, whites have their truth, blacks have their truth. And so we're trying to communicate without a speaking different languages without a dictionary of translation. And there's it's impossible to communicate across these um you know, these gender or, or or racial divides since we since we cognize the world differently. And ultimately, then uh, human disputes are resolved. You know, the other the ultimate remember we discussed the sophists at the start of our philosophy discussion, you know, uh Pacimicus and the Republic said, quote, justice is the will of the stronger. 
unquote, right? And, and the, the postmodernists agree with that, that the ultimate arbiter of human disputes is force. And, and we have to we have to uh, side with the people who have been who've been coerced, who've been oppressed and victimized. I think in in, in a nut, small nutshell, that's the postmodern. That's, that's, that's perfect. Now, so basically, just to try to distill it and put it quickly, and then I want to make my mm -hmm. comment. Marx taught that there's a, a polylogism that people in different mm -hmm. classes fundamentally think differently. They like right. said, cognize the world differently. Right. That's what right. these folks have done, you know, whether it be the critical race theorists, your, your postmodernists, is they've just expanded this out beyond class to right. race, ethnicity, culture, sex, and, ge and gender. Right. Exactly. Yeah, whatever it is, a sexual preference or, or whatever it is that we all think differently. What I find, I don't know, disturbing, ridiculous, funny, all, all in one is this notion. There is no objective truth. But white Europeans have oppressed everybody is an objective truth. There is no objective morality, but <laughs> white European males are evil. That's right. And the problem is, is they say contradictions aren't a problem. So that doesn't even bother them. And once you're dealing with people like that, I mean, I think that's what kind of what you're talking about is what other option is there? It has to devolve ultimately, not immediately, but in the final analysis to force. Because if you can't understand how someone else is thinking, you can't communicate with them. There's no objective wrong except for what I'm doing. What is that in the end going to lead to? And I think that we're seeing that at least in, in some spots. Would you say so maybe within the protests on the streets or in the universities? Is that what's going on? Is that there's just a, a, a what's what I'm looking for? Like a breakdown in rationality and communication and norms of decency. You know, Michael, that's ex you're exactly right. That contradiction is is inherent in their thinking. Before I answer your question, let me point let me point something else out. The theory is ridiculous, just yeah. on fa at face value. I mean, it would be impossible for a man and a woman, for for example, to have an intimate discussion and come to a meeting of the minds. You know, or a, a black or a, a white person, or a straight or a gay gay. You know, since we we cognize the world differently on on their theory. There'd be no possibility of having the kind of discussion that you and I are having right now sure. with, with two white males. But we both had, you know, these kinds of discussions where we had meetings of the minds and, you know, connected intimately with a woman, with a black dude, with with I, I speak about my, my girlfriend from India who's non-white, non-male, non-Western, you know, but we had, you know, we had a... a you yeah, know, but, a but the Indians tend to be successful when they come to this country, so they really don't count. Like, like, yeah, they're not, yeah, they're really... You, you they're know, really... Asians, Asians, Jews, Indians, the successful minorities, they don't really yeah, factor yeah. into this thing. Well, the LA Times called... Larry Elder, the white face of black supremacy. I mean, the, the black face of white supremacy. So, you know, they, they and yeah, the, uh, the, the Indians could become like, uh, you know, white, white man light or something on, on, on this mentality. But here, to answer your question, <laughs> it's ironic. Excuse me. The people who go through the universities who are supposed to be the educated, you know, culture elite, they're the ones who are, you know, the are, are the most savage. Your point previously about the man in the street, you know, every man and every woman, the the less formal schooling people have, I don't I don't conflate schooling with education. There was that mm -hmm. famous line ascribed to attributed to Mark Twain, although I think somebody else said at first that I never let my schooling interfere with my education. Um, but the people who have the most schooling, as a general rule, people are individuals, so there are always exceptions. The people who have the most schooling and should be the most educated and the most cultured and the most refined and the most uh, morally upright are the ones who are rioting on college campuses, you know, and uh, and so on and, and, and so forth. Yeah, because... The postmodern, the Marxist postmodernist mentality, is prevalent amongst intellectuals, amongst the intelligentsia, and they teach it to their students. Uh, the people who have less schooling have less of that propaganda, and in the United States, generally, generally rejected. If we go out to you know Nebraska, and you know, talk to people who you know who who are working you know uh, in, out in the work world, and uh, 
you know, had had a high school education and actually never went to college, that they're going to tend to be uh, flag waving, patriotic Americans, not communists or not, not hate white people or not racist of any kind as a general rule. Yeah, we were just talking before we came on air about Steve Hicks book explaining postmodernism. <clears throat> and I remember, and it's been a long time since I read it, but he talked about how theoretically the capitalists have won. You know, Mises, Hayek, Milton Friedman have demolished the socialists and the Keynesians. In in practice, we've seen the result of the, the welfare states. We've seen the result of what happened with the Soviet Union and all the communist countries all over the place. So it's almost as if these postmodernists, the leftists, the wokeists, they have to devolve into this. There's no such thing as objective truth. There's no objective reason, no way to communicate because otherwise they lose, right? If, if, if they accept reason, facts, uh, you know, uh, logical communication, they've lost already. Yeah, they're, they're in bad shape if, if, if they do that. First of all, uh, let's, let's look at, at different arenas here. In the real world, you know, in real life, in real time, uh, you look at the semi-capitalist countries in contrast to the more socialist, more communist, more, you know, more collectivist ones. And it's the semi-capitalist, well, the ones that have some element of individual rights, uh, uh, have much higher living standards, longer life expectancies, more flourishing life. The ones that have no element of individual rights, where the, you know, their Islamic dictatorships or their Marxist dictatorships or whatever, they have lower living standards, shorter life expectancies, you, you know, the arts and the sciences and literature don't flourish there like they do in the in the semi-capitalist countries. So in, in the real world, you know, the, what do they say? The game is over. The scores are on the board. You know, I mean, we we know this. Now, you mentioned in theoretical economics, the same. The free market economists have demolished, you know, the the pro-socialist. In, in economics, and they show brilliantly why, in terms of economic principles, the real world is as it is. Why the the, the capitalist or semi-capitalist systems have much higher uh, living standards and life expectancies than the non-capitalist or anti-capitalist. And then, make it even worse for the leftists, here's this pesky Ayn Rand, you know, who he wasn't content to, to leave capitalism simply with an economic defense. He says she wrote Atlas Shrugged, you know, thematically to provide a moral defense for capitalism. And my God, did did she ever, I mean, she she showed why capitalism is the system of uh, of life promotion right down to the to the deepest level. You know, that that man's mind is the means of survival. The mind requires individual rights and, and political economic liberty. Wrote it and not even in, in a in a nonfiction book or essay, which a few people would read, but in the most brilliant plot story that anybody's ever ever written, it's been translated every language all you know all over the world. Uh, so yeah, and any way we look at it, in economic theory, in ph philosophic theory, and in in real life, yeah, the the leftists have lost, and so uh, they can't read, they can't they can't point the facts. And they can't give rational arguments promoting the life-giving superiority of communism or any form of socialism over, over capitalism. And so, yeah, I think it's necessary that they be, over the last, since the 1960s, they've moved more and more and more towards activism, which means violence, rather than argument, you know, uh, logical argumentation. A few days ago, I posted some quotes from your book. I, I posted them on my uh, Facebook thing. And I, you know, at the bottom, Andrew Bernstein in the title of the book. And I posted uh, some stuff that you said about the alt-right. What people, some people in my Facebook feed don't understand because they say, why are you always criticizing the right? <clears throat> the problem is I don't have a bunch of leftists in my Facebook feed. <laughs> so, so if I'm going to engage in debate and conversation, rather than just have an echo chamber, that's who I, I need to criticize. Mm -hmm. And but, besides, they they deserve it. They're, 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 they're. Well, there's that too. But one of them even said to me, well, I know Andrew Bernstein thinks the left is the bigger threat. And so I said to him, well, I said, I'm not going to give too much of the book away, but I don't think he would classify the alt-right as right. 
Right. Yeah. Right. They're the Nazi left. <clears throat> right. Well, here's here's where my, my problem comes in. And this is where I, th- I think we're going to disagree, but ultimately we're going to agree. Because you said at the beginning, the left is far more harmful than the right. But in your book, and you did something I thought was phenomenal. You said that right and left have no meaning unless we put collectivists on one side and individualists on the other. Right. And I agree with that. I But I think we should go further. I think we should get rid of left, right altogether because I think they're utterly meaningless. And I think if you do that, I think what we need to do is have the, the people that are in the side of reason and individualism on one side and collectivist irrationalists on the other side. And I think if you do that, I think the religious right that you mentioned are very collectivistic. Uh, I mean, look what Tucker Carlson said recently about libertarian economics. I mean, he's just, he, he sounded like Karl Marx he, talking about the system was set up to, you know, favor the, the elites or some such thing about, you know, libertarian economics, which really we've never had libertarian economics. In yeah, and he should know better how many self-made men are like people who rose up out of nothing. Uh, yeah, I'm inclined to think he does know better. Uh, you know, I can't prove it, but if I had to bet, I would think he's a fraud. Uh, that's my, you know, that's my sense. I don't have a problem saying it. I, I know he's a smart guy. I can't believe he's suddenly gone dumb. But I think that the, I think the Trump movement would classify, I put them on the, with the collectivists and the irrationalists. Uh the modern, of course, the woke, the social justice warriors, you know, the critical race people, I put them all on the irrational side. The problem, I think, I mean, you do a good job of arguing individualism is the answer. That's the cure. And I agree with you. I think you're right. And, and what I'm going to say, I'm guilty of this very thing to an extent, and I don't know how to avoid it. Those of us that favor individualism, individual rights, capitalism, and in there I'm counting small L libertarians, objectivists, classical liberals. We tend to argue with each other. And there's so many uh, collectivists on all sides of us that it's we can't really afford to argue with each other. But there's a lot of people, as I've been pointing out lately, who classify themselves with the, think they're in the individualist capitalist camp. For instance, anarcho-capitalists. Or the uh, you know the Mises Caucus of the Libertarian Party, or some pop culture libertarians that I see online, I don't think that there's room for objectivists at least to work with them in in this movement. So you'd end up having to cut them off, and then you're really stuck with a very small group. What is the way around that? Because I think you're right that individualism is the solution, but that takes people being convinced of individualism. And so, uh, first of all, I want to know if you think I'm onto something with my assessment, with my um, understanding of your viewpoint, and with what I've said about the individualism versus collectivism. But then, what's to be done? Yeah, a couple of points, Michael. Um, regard because you made you made several points. Yeah. One, one start with the left-right distinction. It's. Uh, the, those are spatial metaphors. They right. have no literal applicability to contemporary political issues. No. The terminology dates back to the French Revolution. I was just going to ask you to tell us about that. Yeah. Okay, so it's, I think that's a good good place to start with your analysis. Is tell us the history of where that comes from. Yeah, oh, I'm I'm not an expert. Not the best of my no, knowledge. But, yeah, you, you, as, you know, it's the French Revolution. Yeah, as a speaker faced the assembly, the representatives of the uh, proletariat, to use Marx's terms, or the working class, sat to his left. And the representatives of the bourgeoisie or the middle class sat, you know, sat sat to his right. So hence left wing, right wing. But even that, it's already it's already loaded with Marxist thinking because you know, to an individualist, the economic class is a very secondary issue. What the hell is it? What's the difference if somebody is a you know is a ditch digger or you know or he owns his own bakery or you know or, or whatever? The question is: Is he an honest man? Is he a rational man? You know, uh, is right. he? So on and so forth. He has all the rights of a of an individual in a free society. Whatever he does for a living, so it's already loaded with Marxists. You know, distinguishing between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat as if their interests were different, uh, and and they aren't. What's different, people whose interests are different, is honest men versus dishonest men, rational men versus irrational men. Their interests are different. Uh, 
but you know, we go, we go, they, they, they don't have, we don't have different interests based on what profession we have or how much money we make or you know, how deep our, our pockets are. So uh, I always tell my logic students, look, and what you said is exactly right. If we drop the spatial metaphor and look at the issues in literal terms, it's the individualist capitalists versus the collectivist socialists, the people who believe in individual rights and limited government versus those who believe in the dominance of the state over the individual. Uh, and so if we're going to speak in literal terms, then that's what we do. I, I'm I'm willing to to retain the left right distinction if and only if we define it in that way, that the left means collective proponents of collectivism, you know, the dominance of the group over the individual, and socialism, you know, the uh, eradication of individual rights, the eradication of private property, and the the dominance of the state, not only in the economic system but over every aspect of an individual's life. You know, if and and right wing means the supporters of individual rights and let's say fair capitalism, then it becomes a convenient shorthand rather than say individualism, capitalism versus collectivism, socialism. But if and only if we define it in that way. Other than that, I would just jettison the terminology and you know and use the literal terminology, however clumsy it is. Uh now regarding the endless bickering and infighting between different groups of objectivists or different groups of pro-capitalists or different groups of, uh, of um, uh, you know, people who support individual rights. His, I, I can tell you a story, true story. It was years ago. I was, I don't even remember. I, I was lecturing for the Ayn Rand Institute. I don't remember where it was. So, you know, I, I gave hundreds of lectures at college campuses for them over the years. And I don't even remember what lecture I was given, but somebody, what I do remember, somebody in the Q&A was talking about the this fracture, these end, endless fissures or schisms in objectivism, and specifically, you know, Peikoff and Kelly, Leonard Peikoff and David Kelly. And he compared it to Marxism and, you know, the schism between, you know, uh, uh, Lenin, uh, Stalin and Trotsky. And so when he finished ask, answering the question, you know, I ask, asking the question, I said, so I just want to point out one thing that's really important here, like literally life and death importance. Marxism believes in the initiation of force, it upholds it. Class warfare, you got to kill the, the, the representatives of the owning class. And so, you know, believing in the initiation of force, Stalin had his agents cave in Trotsky, Stalin, you know, and, and, and murdered him. Uh, objectivists, on the other hand, reject the initiation of force in any iteration. And, if, and, and to the extent they live this out, and they usually do, when they strongly disagree, they stop speaking to one another. You know, <laughs> and Leonard Pigov and David Kelly aren't hiring assassins, you know, to track each other down and try and bash in their skulls. That's a literally life and death difference between Marxism and, and, it, and, it, and it's and an astute point, too. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, so having said, said that, you know, and I give objectivists two thumbs up on that. They they uh, I know of, I don't know of any cases off the top of my head where they where they did try and kill each other, over, you know, over this. Uh, I think. You know, there there are certain I could I could understand people regard certain principles, you know, with open system, closed system. I you know, I have good friends who think this is a this is a you know an enormously important issue and, and and we shouldn't associate with with you know with people on the on the other side. I don't I don't agree with that, but I understand people can draw the line in the sand and this is where we're not going to associate with other people. They have the right to do that. Uh, but the point is, I think to answer your question, where we agree, we don't even necessarily have to form alliances or team up with each other. We can, you know, stop speaking to each other if we want, but we keep making the case. And nobody made the case for individualism and individual rights better than Ayn Rand. And so I would, I would point this out to the libertarians or the Republicans, who, anybody, or anybody, who, if there's still anybody left in the Republican Party who claims to believe in individual rights. Read Ayn Rand, you know, amongst the conservatives, read Ayn Rand. Uh, she made the case for individualism and individual rights. She made the moral case for capitalism. Read Atlas Shrugged. This, nobody's made the case nearly as powerfully as Ayn Rand has. So, but anyhow, even if we <laughs> should we stop associating with other supporters of individualism and we have a small group who agree with us, we still, we still have freedom of speech. It's becoming more and more under fire, which is scary, but we still have freedom of speech. 
and we and we could in, in any form open to us in, in the classroom for me just talking to neighbors colleagues friends family members you know grassroots personal movement online on social media you know you you write letters to the editor you, you, there's all, there's, in, in every form open to us we could speak out on behalf of individual rights and individualism as the cure for racism, colorblind individualism as the cure for racism in any of its hideous forms. It's interesting that you have to use the modifier colorblind individualism to because individualism by definition would be colorblind. Yes. But yes. in today's world, you, you have to specify. So I got a couple, a couple more areas I, I want to address. First, it has to do more with just a modern political question. Where would you put MAGA, the MAGA movement in your left right uh realignment that you've come up with uh well i think trump and and and, and not just trump the republicans more broadly oh sure yeah not yeah. Just, I'm, I'm not i'm not singling out maga to separate them from other yeah. republicans the the reason i ask it is because maga is the driving force right now in the republican party and there's a lot of people who seem to think that MAGA is a capitalist or a pro-capitalist movement. Uh, so that that's why I asked the question. I'm not giving your run-of-the-mill Republicans a, a pass by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, I, I, no, I understand. The Republican Party is is a mess. Uh, they don't. They they really don't know what they stand for, and they haven't for a long time. Now I think the Democrats are more dangerous. But that's because they do know what they stand for. They're Marxists, you know, and and they've they're not they're not even pushing us towards socialism anymore. I think they're pushing us towards communism, that is towards explicit totalitarianism. And the smoking gun is they're the ones who are virulently opposed to freedom of speech. They're the ones who would shut this conversation down. But I don't know. I don't think Trump. I don't think Trump would. Uh, but the, you know, so they stand for Marxism and and not only socialism anymore, but I wouldn't say the Democrats are literally communists at this point. Not even Bernie Sanders is openly calling for the, you know, the abrogation of private property and the nationalization of industries. And, uh, although, like I, you know, the the attack on free speech is terrifying. You know, what the Twitter file showed us, what the FBI coaching Twitter on what could be said and what couldn't be said on COVID and global warming and other issues, and establishing a disinformation governance board at Homeland Security. I mean, my God, bad enough if they did it at the Department of the Interior where they just said, well, this is true and this is false and the government's making these edicts. But Homeland Security is a law enforcement organization. <laughs> so, so if I disagree with what the government says is true, am I going to have armed federal agents at my door to arrest me? It's possible. Uh, I don't even think Trump st stands for that. But anyway, so I'm, well, my, my point about the Democrats is they're not communists yet, but I think they're trending strongly towards totalitarianism. What the hell do the Republicans stand for? Uh, they're, they're this mixed, I, I think it's the very mixture, that the mongrel mixture that makes them less dangerous. Part Christianity, without a doubt, you know, will ban the you know woman's right to abortion and, you know, and, and so on and so forth, you know, ban... Gay marriage, you know, and you know, and 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 issues like that. Part nationalism, you know, this this is where this is this is the essence of Trump, right? You know, the my country right or wrong ment mentality, uh, uh, as as distinct from patriotism. I think I think patriotism is, to me anyway, is support individual rights, support freedom, support the United States because. More than any other country, it uh, you know it upholds individual rights. But, but when my country is wrong, I criticize. In fact, I take I, I put into practice my individual right to freedom of speech, you know, to and and I criticize. Not, not my country, right or wrong. I think I think it's very muddled on um, immigration. Uh, you know, I can understand the concern about illegal immigration is a problem. Is it does it border on xenophobia and racism? You know, I think for some people, I think for some members of a bag, it does. Uh, so I think it's a it's a combination of Christianity, this kind of irrational nationalism, which is a type of collectivism. You know, uh, my, my 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 collective, my country, my group, right or wrong, and then I think there's still. Is slightly alive in the Republican Party. You know, I see it sometimes with Vivek Ramaswamy. I see it sometimes with uh, DeSantis. 
uh, the slight element, uh, even with Trump, the slight element of the founding fathers, which is absent, I think, in the Democrats, they had Marxist, slight element of the founding fathers, you know, belief in uh, in, in individual individual rights. They, they, for instance, they're not, they're not nearly as, uh, to me, the most important issue of all is freedom of speech, because that's freedom of the mind. And it's not the Republicans leading the charge against it here, yeah. cancel culture and then and censorship of social media platforms with disinformation governance board and homeland security, even using the term disinformation. What's that term? What's wrong with, with truth and falsity? You know, well, you know, well, honesty or dishonesty. The term disinformation, for God's sake, was coined by Joseph Stalin. Why are the Democrats throwing out a Stalinist term? That's kind of that's kind of ominous in and of itself. Yeah, uh, you're you're gonna step in it with that one, <laughs> I'm afraid. Because I can come right back at you with what's up with Trump saying they're going to poison the blood. I mean, so if, if we're going to say what's up with people using the terms that dangerous people and evil people have used, that's pretty bad, too. What? The, I don't even know what Trump. Trump, Trump talked I mean, about, I think, he, immigrants he, he, coming in a literal, over in a literal Nazi. They're, Nazi they're gonna, sense. Well, I don't know. He, he says he never read Mein Kampf. So. <laughs> I don't know, but but I, my my only point is I, I not that I disagree with you. I just think that there's, and I don't want to say both sides because I think that you're ultimately your point is right that these aren't really two sides. And I think that. Oh wait, hold a second. Did Trump say that the illegal immigrants are the poison American blood? I I mean, I'm gonna Google it real fast so I can get the exact. I, I heard point. something to that effect, but I didn't read. I didn't read the story. So he he means literally. Uh, uh, mongrelize the races kind of thing, the way the Nazis the Nazis did. It says, "This is what he said." I got it right here from Reuters. Let me find the the, the quote. He said, uh, "He says they're poisoning the blood of our country all over the world. They are pouring into our country." Who's they? It's about Muslims. Um, he's, it's, 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 the problem is I don't, I don't want to say what it says because it, it's not a full quote. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they break it up. So I don't And it know comes from, it. and it comes from leftist sources who would do anything to dis, discredit him. Uh, now if he means that literally, then, then, then he, you're certainly on strong grounds to criticize him because that's a Nazi, you know, that's a Nazi mentality. We're talking about the, you know, uh, that our culture is great and stands for freedom, whatever it is, because of our blood, because of our biology. And these foreigners, uh, you know, they come from inferior bloodlines. He says they come from Africa, they come from Asia, they come from South America. I, so I, I don't know. I do know this, that it, it's a it's a dangerous sort of thing to uh, they they meaning just Im immigrants or yeah. Ill illegal immigrants. I, to be honest with you, I wouldn't care because, in my view, I don't I don't really make much of a distinction. I think that the immigration laws are unconstitutional, and I think that people have a natural right of of migration, and I think the people in this country have the right to deal with whomever they want. But ultimately, my, my main point and what I want is an answer. I want you to tell me what you think. Because I would put in your new classification that I'm I'm fully behind, I'm putting MAGA on the left because they're I think they're a collectivist movement, uh, and I think they're an irrationalist movement. I don't think they're individualist. I don't think they're capitalist. They're different in, in tone and priorities than the wokesters, but in terms of fundamentals, I think they're very very similar. Uh, you see, I, I don't, I don't agree, Mike. Because to, to me, the MAGA movement is more mixed. Uh, you know, like like my old buddy Dinesh D'Souza, who I debated, you know, on Christianity, and you know, did you? Yeah, I, you know, ten years ago, debated him on the, whether Christianity was good or bad for mankind. The debate's on my website if you want to watch it. Yeah, I think I'm I, gonna. Yeah, I, I think I intellectually crushed that poor guy, but you know, a lot of people agree with me and some disagree. But anyhow. Uh, D'Souza pointed out, not in the debate, but elsewhere, that most legal immigration into the United States is, is non-white and Trump supports it. And I think, you know, that's uh, that's an inter that, you know, that I think that's that, that's an important point. I think Trump is, you know, is is more mixed on 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 this issue. And uh, I think there, there are some pro-capitalist, pro-individualist elements 
in him. You know, like he he, he started this was it the seven, 1776 initiative to combat this the 1619 project. And yeah, and, but that's and, more. See, that's cultural. He's not for. And I, and I want to pivot because I want to get back to the race stuff. But I don't think Trump's a racist. No, I don't either. I'm not. I'm not. I, I think that what I think about Trump is he'll say whatever he needs to say to cater to whomever he's trying to cater to. I don't think it has to do with race. I I would not disagree that you he's know. an unprincipled pragmatist. I think yeah. uh, most politicians are. Maybe they all are. But yeah, but, I think he certainly is. But as far as being pro-capitalist, I mean, it, this is a guy, he doesn't want to get rid of entitlement programs. He favors some sort of government involvement in the healthcare. He wants to negotiate with, I think the government should be negotiating with pharmaceutical companies. He wants to have paid family leave. He put pressure on the Federal Reserve to keep interest rates low, but no one blames him for, well, I shouldn't say no one, but his supporters don't blame him for inflation. I just don't see him as a capitalist. And that's where the danger lies is because I think people do see him as a capitalist. And if they see that what he's advocating is capitalism, they're saying they don't want anything to do with it. But I, I, what I want to what I want to do is get back a little bit because you did a very good job at pointing out how the very people who cry racism and are claiming how the, the you know blacks in this country are harmed, it's their policies that do the harming. Absolutely. So you, you mentioned, for instance, I think you mentioned minimum wage was one of them. And then there were others that are just aren't coming quickly in my mind. But I'd like you to address some of those on how the are, are we going to call them the woke left, the left, the wokesters? What, 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 what can we what can we refer to them as? No, no, that's a good question. But and before I answer it, does, does that, let me just go back to Trump for sure. a minute because I think you're right. Everything you said is true. I just think he's there's a there's a a, a mixture in there. You know, that he recognizes uh, that man made global pernicious human caused warming is is a false theory. He said he wants to drill, 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 drill. You know, sure. or, you know, lift regulations and taxes on the energy companies. There are some elements in Trump. That are pro capitalist. He's 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 very mixed. Whereas the left is is generally well, I don't, very I don't consistent. disagree. I don't disagree. Yeah, but, that his but there's where there's where I there's where I agree with you. It's it's the good elements in the mixture that'll blind some people to to the bad, because the, there isn't any good element. Uh, there isn't any capitalist element in his enemies, but there's some in him. But I support Trump as the lesser two evils. But I agree with you. You know, as my good friend Robert Nasa said to me, he's still evil. <laughs> you know. Um, so, yeah. So, yes. So, you know, I think I think you're generally right about about that. And that's why I think the Republicans are in general, are, the very lack of consistency makes them less dangerous to to freedom than the left is. Again, freedom of speech to me is the is the that's main a, issue a, because that, it's a, because it's freedom argument. of the mind. It's freedom of the mind. That, that's a free point. I just think that they're fundamentally they're collectivists. That That's that's. Well, it, there's, it, a lot, there's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot in 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 there that is, yeah, that is nationalistic and 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 collectivist. Um, but anyhow, to get back to your to your question, I mean, one of the essays that I wrote for Capitals Magazine several years ago that was incorporated into the booklet is titled "Leftist Supremacy, Not White Supremacy, Is the Gravest Threat to Black Lives." And so, you know, Biden talks a lot about white, you know, white supremacists and the Proud Boys and, and everything. But white supremacists, if you go, if you do some research, they're still around. They're still murderers. They hate blacks. They hate Jews. They hate gays. They hate, you know, uh, Latino immigrants. Right. They're so evil. They're evil. Yeah, oh, well, without evil a doubt. Collectivists, they're rationalists. Absolutely. By, and violent ones. Yeah. And, but they're, you know, out of 234 million white Americans, they're still around, but we made a lot of progress over the last hundred years, especially since the civil rights movement of the of the 1960s, which, by the way, as Confucius liked to say, the beginning of wisdom is to see to it that things are called by their right names. The right name for the civil rights movement is the individual rights movement for black Americans and long overdue. Uh, but um, they're still around. But 234 million white Americans, they're very marginalized. They're a tiny group that most people despise. Most educated Americans don't even know who Richard Spencer is, you know, and he's the, the leading intellectual spokesman for the alt right, you know, white supremacist group. Uh, so they're not the main danger to to black lives. Do his friends call him Dick? Just, just, <laughs> just wondering. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not one of his friends, and don't intend to be. <laughs> but um, 
you know, we got to look at facts. This is part of being objective. The left is very often, uh, they don't like, they're allergic to facts. They regard facts as if, you know, dealing with them, you'll contract, you know, venereal disease. But um, Black Americans, um, they're like almost 50% of the murder victims year in, year out, and slightly over 50% of the homicide perpetrators. Year after year after year after year for decades now, thousands and thousands of Black Americans are murder victims. And year after year after year, 90% of the, of the murderers are Black criminals. And if we really care about Black lives, we start with the main danger of Black lives. The main danger of Black lives are Black criminals. And we wonder, well, how the hell did this happen? 50 years ago, 60 years ago, the Black homicide rate wasn't anywhere near this. Now it's, you know, it's, it's, off, the, it's off the charts. And, you know, part of the reason is the welfare state, you know, aid to families with dependent children and that a woman could get money for every child she has as long as she's not married. As Thomas Sowell pointed out, well, you know, the result of that is if you uh, if you pay people to not get married, then fewer people will get married. You sure. know, <laughs> yeah. And so you have not, that is not just black kids, this is the white kids also. Sure. Uh, the, the illegitimacy rates like cl close to 70 percent in the black American community is significantly higher than it was in the white American community. And you see a lot of kids raised without a, a dad in their life. You know, a single mom so, and some of the single moms are very good, but they can't role model for their son what it means to be a man. And it doesn't matter, black or white. And, and then, by the way, Theodore Dalrymple's book, Life at the Bottom, is really good about life in the British slums. You know about most of his patients. He's a psychiatrist. Um, are on welfare and are white. Same pathology. You find very few fathers. Boys growing. Boys look. Put it in. Boys need a dad. They need a dad. You know to role model for them what it means to be me a man. Somebody who's working hard, honestly contributing to the support of the family. Treats the kid's mother respectfully. Is a firm, loving presence in the life of the children. Uh, and in case after case after case, white, black, America, England, whatever, uh, the kids who are raised without a dad in their lives, they have, they don't do nearly as well in school. They have problems with drugs. They they often form gangs or join gangs and 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 turn you know turn to, turn to criminal violence. Uh, it's not just see one thing we could do to protect black lives is end the war on drugs, because that means there's there's less of a financial incentive you know, to join these violent drug gangs. But that's only a start. It, it needs more than that because a lot of kids join the, you could read the true crime literature on this. I have some anyway. Uh, a lot of kids join gangs because they get a family that way. It's not just money. They do get money, but they get a family that way that they don't have at home where they don't have a father. And very often the stereotype is true. Mom has an alcohol problem or a drug problem, you know, and, and so on. So let me tell you, hold on. I want to tell you about the war on drugs. As I'm reading the, your, your booklet, you got to the tough on crime stuff first before you addressed the war on drugs. And I'm screaming at the book. Yeah. Why don't you just end the goddamn war on drugs? That'd be the, that, that would cut back on a lot of this crime. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, oh, I can't wait to get them across from me in this podcast. I'm going to bring this up. And maybe two sentences later, you said, and they could end the war on drugs. I said, oh, my. Yeah. He's spot on about that. Yeah. And that'll bring the crime rate down. You sure. Um, will. Just I agree. Like it wouldn't make it disappear. By no means. You're absolutely right. But it would it would make a big, big dent. It's a good start. Uh, sure. The, the economist, um, what's his name, Jeffrey Miron, his book, Drug War Crimes, he estimates, it's an estimate, nobody knows for sure, that if drugs were uh, legalized or decriminalized anyway, that the homicide rate in the United States might drop by as much as 70%. I, I wouldn't doubt it. That, that makes sense to me. It was just, I mean, from, yeah, we saw, we saw the homicide rate drop dramatically when alcohol Sure. You know, was legalized in 1933, I think I think it was. Yeah, we haven't uh, learned the lessons yet. No, no, no. The I, government, I why. Uh, that, that was war on drugs one. The government yeah. figured it was the war on drugs was so nice, let's do it twice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you have, you, have, uh, you have the welfare state, you have the the government school system, which just sucks. And it's, everybody seems to agree it's worse in, in a lot of the black urban neighborhoods. And you see the statistics like in, in Baltimore, these kids, 
you know, our seniors and other high school students, and some of them have like a first grade reading, a significant number of first grade reading levels, you know, amongst high school kids. It just breaks, it breaks your heart. And then you mentioned the, the um, a minimum wage laws, you know, economists have railed against it for a long time because they're basically laws against low skilled workers, often, often teenagers, because, you know, if a, somebody's 16 years old and doesn't have any skills yet, uh, maybe his he could sweep. I, I swept the floors at McDonald's. I, I remember those days, you know. So maybe, you know, his labor is worth to McDonald's, I don't know, $5 an hour, $8 an hour, but the minimum wage law is $10 an hour or more. And so McDonald's or whoever it is is going to lose X number of dollars for every hour they employ me. They're not going to hire me. And the uh, economists have pointed out for many years, minimum wage laws do one thing and only one thing. They, they create unemployment. And so you have it in 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 a lot of these high crime black urban neighborhoods, whether, you know, you know, it's funny, Michael, Chicago gets all the notoriety and yet the murder rate is higher in Baltimore and St. Louis and, you know, and, and, you know, and, and, and other places uh, you, you get a bunch of high school, you know, dropouts or graduates who are semi-illiterate, unskilled, uh, don't have a father, you know, and don't have, don't have any family structure. And it's not surprising that you get the, you know, the the rise of these murderous drug gangs and the the violence is is just appalling. So, yes, yeah, the leftist, the, you know, the only people who oppose these leftist policies, Thomas Sowell, you know, the great, their supporters of capitals, Thomas Sowell, the brilliant economist, the late great Walter Williams, brilliant economist, Larry Elder, the libertarian, you know, supporter of, of capitalism. They're the ones who point this out, attack the leftist policies as being so harmful to black Americans. I don't know anybody on the left who's who, who's challenging the policies that lead to this astronomic murder rate amongst black Americans. They, least of all, an organization that calls itself Black Lives Matter. They're the last ones that, that, that they're, are bringing They're up just a front group for, for cultural Marxists. Yeah. So you have, we have this situation where we have coming out of, I would say, academia, modern Marxism. And that's, I don't know how else to put it. Modern Marxist, the postmodernist, cultural relativist, social justice warrior, wokesters. Mm -hmm. that are, they're accused, they, you know, constantly, <laughs> basically they say that it's impossible for white people not to be racist, right? Like, that's um, right, yeah. Robin, right. De, uh, Robin DiAngelo's book I read, you know, a few of them. And basically it's impossible. White people are racist. That's it. That's all there is to it. They teach that. They propose these policies that all they do is harm the very people they claim they want to help. And they're also, and I think this is ultimately part of your thesis, is that they create by with their anti-white rhetoric of backlash, where you lead to an increase in these sort of Richard Spencer type groups where people find, start to gravitate toward them. And I think that's where you talk about the, the coming race war. Now, you're right. not actually predicting that there's going to be a race war. But what you're saying is that this dynamic makes that there a risk for one. Right? Would that be an accurate? Yeah, I'm, yeah I, I, I'm fearful of it. Yeah. I, I say it's possible and I'm, and I'm fearful of it. And you're right, what you just said. Uh, you raise the question, what's the purpose of this virulent anti-white racism? It's obviously false. You know, I mean, we all know, you know, white people who aren't racist. There's probably two of them in this discussion right now. Um, <laughs> you know, what do you mean, probably? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, two, you know, uh, you you know, there's any number of white people. Yeah, but, that, uh, but we're both we both have Jewish last names. We might be in on the international Zionist conspiracy. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Thanks for pointing that out. Gotta keep that in mind. Have you gotten your newsletter, by the way? <laughs> No, nah, I was lost in the mail. But I, uh, you know, a lot of my friends around the country, you know, were, were raised, you know, they're objectivists, most of them, but they're raised in WASPy families. They're one Protestant denomination or another. A lot of them from urban areas were, were raised Catholics, you know, Irish, Italian Catholics, and so on and so forth. And, you know, there's completely colorblind, you, you know, it's look, it's the, the claim's obviously false. Uh, there was a white. You know, it's like it's just as false as the, um, you know, the idea that different genders or different races cognize the world differently and can't and can't communicate. 
the, like I said, there wouldn't be able, there wouldn't be all of these intimate communications yeah. between men and women and so forth, or blacks and white people, you know, if that were true. So it's, the theory is obviously false. And similarly, that, that white people are inveterately racist. What would it be about white skin that would make the white people more racist than people who have brown skin or black skin? I mean, it's it's it's, it's ridiculous. It's false. So what's the purpose of it? And I think there's one obvious purpose, and then there's one underlying purpose that you just mentioned. The obvious purpose is to fill white people with shame, you know, for their success, because, you know, what they take advantage of white privilege and, you know, and so on, and make them much more amenable to a massive redistribution of income that the Marxists want from the white middle class to the, you know, to the non-white poverty class, including the insane idea of slavery, reparations for slavery that ended, you know, 150 years ago. Uh, that, you know, that, that massive grift, evil as it is, is is relatively innocuous compared to the underlying motivation, I think, which is to revitalize the, the more currently uh, dormant white supremacist movement in in this country to, to, you know, to revitalize the Klan and the Nazi party, to have more to have, to have more of these guys march in like in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017 so they can riot in the street against Antifa and Black Lives Matter. Because the left, the Marxist left knows. How do you establish totalitarian state? First thing you need is, is the intellectual, you need the philosophy, you know, that it sets in place. And they have it. They control the universities. They control the intellectual culture. It's heavily Marxist. And then you need the endless street violence. This is the way Mussolini came to power. This is the way Hitler came to power. You know, the brown shirts or black shirts, endless street violence, you know, violence and riots, Antifa and Black Lives Matter in the gutters against the American Nazi Party and the Ku Ku Klux Klan, convincing uh, honest people, capitalism and freedom and individual rights have failed. We need to move towards a strong uh, central government that'll keep, you know, that'll make, you know, they'll put down these riots and maintain war and order. Uh, you, you need that endless street violence to turn a, the Weimar Republic, when the, the American Republic, into a, into a, a communist state, a, a Nazi state, in this, this case, a communist state. And the communist on the Marxist left knows, one, that they don't have to worry about losing this battle to the Nazis, because one, they completely control the intellectual culture and the, you know, in the universities, the school system, Hollywood, the news media, they all hate the white supremacist Nazis. They have no support. The Marxists control the intellectual culture and two, they have a vast superiority of numbers. Everybody comes to a school system, <laughs> you know, gets indoctrinated. Not everybody, but thousands and thousands and thousands get indoctrinated with cultural Marxism, as you put it, not with, not with Nazis. And they have no, no fears that they'll lose the battle. And then they could use the boogeyman they could use a resurgent uh, Nazism, white supremacist mentality as a boogeyman to push us into communism. And Biden does that all the time. He talks about white supremacists as the gravest terror threat in this country. Sure. Well, you've got your solution. Reason, freedom, individualism, or people just read and integrate and implement the ideas of Ayn Rand. <laughs> I think that would be fantastic. Read Atlas Shrugged very carefully, objectively, yeah. honestly. That's, yes, and, absolutely. And not just Atlas Shrugged, but I can't get it to show. There, oh, there upside down, I got it upside down. And there he's got it. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, thank you. this too. So thank you. Thank where you, where can they find you? You got a website they can go to, right? Oh, yeah. My website is very simple, andrewbernstein.net. You know, uh, andrewbernstein.net. And, uh, nothing you know, my complicated. Am- nothing complicated. My you know, my Amazon page has this book and my, you know, my booklet and my my recent novel, Reckoning, which also about race war, you know, comes to America, which is brutal because it's about race war. But it's a hell of a story, if I say so myself. You know, but no the, bias. You're not biased. Oh, no, no. Oh, <laughs> both the the Jewish racists catch hell, the black racists catch hell. They all... Uh, you know, no, I, I have no bias. I, yeah, I, I'm biased in the way I'm biased in favor of colorblind individualism against any form of racism. But reckoning, you know, my novel on this is is powerful story, and all my other books, uh, you know, heroes, legends, champions, why heroism matters, and you know, and, uh, why Johnny still can't read, write, or or understand math, and what we can do about it. Uh, that, you know, you can find them all up on my Amazon page. 
awesome. And uh, we will definitely be having you back at some point because you're definitely one of my favorite guests. Most fun, most stimulating, very, very good. So yeah, it was thank, just a kid, just a kid from much. Brooklyn, just a kid from Brooklyn, kid from Michael. Brooklyn. And I love, I love uh, being on your show. So thanks for having me on. We do. What do they call it? Kibitzin. That's what my yeah. grandfather did. Kibitzin. There you uh, go. <laughs> all right. For now, this is the Rational Eagle is signing out. I'm Michael Leibowitz. Remember, tell me what you think. Leave your comments. Push the like button. It's important. Till next time.